Does anyone remember what book of the Bible we've been going through on Wednesday nights? I'm not asking for my sake. <laughs> Proverbs. Anyone remember what book of the Bible we're going through? And we're not going to do it like I do a lot of these books, verse by verse. I don't think Proverbs lends itself to that. But I would like to point out some things that are very, very, very important and highlights. And so Proverbs 30, though, is a chapter that I will go through verse by verse. Because it's unique to the rest of it in the sense that it's a sermon. So let me read the first three verses and then let me talk you through this great chapter of the Bible. I've always been intrigued by this. Always love this chapter. Although most of the time I don't have any idea what it's about. Okay. But I've been asking God for wisdom. So the words of Agur, the son of Jacob, even the prophecy... The man spake unto Ethiel, even unto Ethiel, and Ukal. Surely I am more brutish than any man, and I do not have the understanding of a man. I neither learned wisdom nor have the knowledge of the holy. Let me stop right there. Because right in those three verses is all kinds of little mysteries and riddles. That's what I like about Proverbs. One of the things he said at the beginning in Proverbs 1 is that the reason the book was written so that we can understand dark sayings. Not morally dark, but deep, deep things, right? So Proverbs is very, very many deep things, very, very important, deep, deep sayings, teachings. First of all, we got to figure out who Agur is. Now, remember, Proverbs is not all Solomon. A lot of them came right from David. Solomon said, this is what my father taught me. This is what my mother taught me. Bathsheba gave us a lot of the Proverbs. Solomon himself wrote 3,000 Proverbs, but we don't have all those. Proverbs is a collection, although Solomon gave a good bulk of it. But Proverbs is a collection of the wisdom of many people. Okay, and this Agur is one of them. Who is Agur? The words of Agur, the son of Jacob. He's the son of Jacob. Uh, now, here's the thing. Uh, well, let, let me just go through this three. Even the prophecy, the man spake unto Ithiel, even unto Ithiel, and Ukal. Now, let me break this down because the first three verses are, are kind of different. First of all, Ithiel and Ukal are, is not people. Ithiel and Ukal is a statement he didn't speak unto Ithiel and Ukal. He spoke. And then the Hebrew words, Ithiel and Ukal. Okay. Ithiel and Ukal. What, is, what did he say? What does it say? He said, I have wearied myself, is what he said. I have wearied myself, said the man. I have wearied myself, and I'm done. Okay, so that's what Ithiel and Ukal means. Who has wearied himself? Agur, son of Jacob. Second of all, Jacob is a contraction of another statement, which is, the Lord, blessed is he. The Lord, blessed is he. The, the Hebrews like to do that. They do acronyms and stuff like that. The Lord, blessed is he. Okay. And third of all, agar has a meaning. Agar means the sojourner. Does everyone know what a sojourner is? A pilgrim. We have no home in this life. So, you could, right off the bat, you gotta, you gotta re, reconfigure this. And let me read it, what, how it should sound. The words of the sojourner, the son of Yahweh, blessed is he, the burden. The man declares, I have wearied myself, O God. I have wearied myself, O God. And I have come to an end. That's Ethiel and Lucal. For I am more stupid than any man, and I do not have the understanding of a man. Oh, one more correction. I have uh, wearied myself. I am more stupid than any man. I do not have the understanding or the wisdom of a man. But what it says, but I do, but I have, and it doesn't read that way in the King James, but there's a translational problem. But I have the knowledge of the holy. 
Okay, I don't have the wisdom that I should, but I have the knowledge of the holy. In other words, I do not have as much wisdom as I know that I should at the end of my life. I should, you know, you never, you never feel like you've arrived if you're truly humble. I don't have the wisdom, but I do have one thing going for me. I know God. I know God. Now, there's a riddle in this. Who is Agar? Who is the sojourner? There's one person in the Bible who, at the end of his life, and this is a great story, too, another time, he goes to Pharaoh. He's a shepherd, and Pharaoh's the ruler of the most powerful nation on earth in Genesis 49. And he calls, he says, uh, well, let's look at it. Uh, hold your finger here, Genesis 49, 7, because it sounds a lot like this. He goes to Pharaoh. He found out his son that he thought was dead is alive. And he's presented to Pharaoh. Now, the Egyptians felt that uh, shepherds were an abomination. <laughs> so he, what does he do for a living? He's a shepherd, okay? But Pharaoh was very gracious to him, okay? So what, let's see. For Genesis, I think, uh, 49, 7, but I may be wrong here. Uh, no, it is not 49, 7. Basically, he goes to Pharaoh. I, I wrote the verse down wrong. But he stands there and says, the years of my life have been weary and I am weak and, and basically, and I'm almost dead, okay. And I'm a sojourner. I am a sojourner. Boy, I wish I could find that one. It's somewhere in Genesis 49. It's when he goes before Pharaoh. Anyway, 47.9. Can we look at that? Because it's important enough for me uh, to get this. Thank you, brother. It's one good thing about preaching to this congregation. Jacob said to Pharaoh, the, day, the days of the years of my pilgrimage, sojourner, I'm a sojourner, are 130 years. Few and evil have them then been the days of the years of my life, and I have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers in their pilgrimage. I'm a sojourner. I have not lived as long as my fathers have. 130 years. Few and evil. Well, when you read the story of Jacob, wow, what a life. And one day we'll go into that. We'll look at that. But uh, I believe, now it doesn't matter. If I'm wrong, it doesn't matter. It won't change a thing. But I believe that Agur is Jacob and that this is his wisdom. And there's other reasons why I believe this. Now, what is the theme of this sermon is going to be humility and arrogance. That's a pretty good theme, right? Humility and arrogance. So right off the bat, he says, I'm stupid. Verse 2. <laughs> the more you know, the more you know you don't know. Right? You think, man, if I could ever get to this certain level, then I'll just feel so good about myself. I feel worse about myself now than I ever have in my life because the more you know, the more you know you don't know. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? Because he goes on to say, look, I don't have the wisdom that I should, but I do know God. So there is one point that I want to make right off the bat. You don't have to know everything if you know God. He knows everything. You don't have to know everything. Now, look, I, do, I don't think it's wise for people to say, good, I don't want to know much at all. I already talk, We already talked about that in Proverbs. That the, 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 how long, oh, you simple ones, will you love your simplicity? God doesn't want you to be ignorant. God does not want you to not know. Okay, God wants you to have a healthy hunger and to grow in the grace and knowledge of God, right? But on the other hand, the more you know, the more you don't know. So he's just like... You know, the years of my life have been few and evil. And here he says, I'm, I'm stupid, but I do have the knowledge of the holy. And then he gives this beautiful, beautiful riddle here. Who hath ascended up into heaven, or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fists? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is his son's name, if you can tell? <laughs> this is great, too. Man, this is fantastic. Look, this is Proverbs, right? So this is wisdom literature. And who is the ultimate and penultimate example of wisdom? But God. Who has ascended up and descended? This is a riddle. Who went up and who came down? Okay, yeah, it's, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. What did Jacob see in a dream? 
He, he lays his head on a pillow, but it's not a pillow, it's a rock. And, and he sees a ladder, which is really a staircase. And what does he see? Angels of God ascending and descending. Now, why do angels of God ascend and descend? Because angels serve God and they go up there and they bring the blessings of heaven down here. And they go back up there and they bring the blessings of heaven down here. And so he saw this ladder or this staircase. He saw who it was who ascends and descends, not angels. Jesus himself, this mystery is finally solved in John chapter 1. I won't have you turn there. But he says to Nathaniel, who was, came to some kind of a faith, he says, you think that you believe me because what I said about that fig tree? You're going to see the angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Who is the one that ascends and descends? It's God. Who is the one Jesus said again in John chapter 3, verse 13, no man can ascend to heaven, but the Son of Man. What's he saying there? We are so bankrupt. We couldn't get there. We're just too bankrupt spiritually. We're too sinful and evil. If we are going to get there, he's going to have to come down and take us back up. And is that not the gospel, right? So he's given this riddle, which the Jews had, had kept it for centuries before Jesus. And, you know, what's, their answer would be God. Of course, obviously God. He ascends, he descends. And then uh, look at the next one. Who gathers the wind in his fists? Who gathers the wind in his fist? Well, now, we've got to understand something about the word wind and breath and all that. It is in both Hebrew and Greek, both languages of the Bible, they are... It's always to refer to the wind, of course, but they are also spirit. The spirit of God, the spirit of man is in the hands of God. Okay, God, Jesus said, don't be afraid of the one that can hurt your body. Fear the one that can take your body, soul, spirit, and cast it into hell. Who can gather the spirit into his hands? And here's another thing the Lord's been showing me lately. He runs this world and this universe through angels, spirits. The book of Hebrews, he makes his angels spirits, his ministers a flame of fire. But who controls all that? Who runs all this complexity? <laughs> See, this is not only a description of God, but remember, this is wisdom. He's teaching us about wisdom. He says, I do not have the wisdom, but I do know God. God has the wisdom. So part of the answer to the riddle is, who hath uh, gathered the wind in his fist? Who hath bound the waters as a garment? Okay, now you take something like water, okay? I would not know how to make clothes out of water, and neither would you. We don't have that kind of wisdom. God can... Didn't it say he came, went, went, came down in a cloud? Could you make clothes out of water? I couldn't make clothes out of water. And I don't know of anyone on this earth that could make clothes out of water. Guess what? God knows how to dwell in a cloud. Now, this is not me trying to be funny. This is literally, this is a, a description, a sophisticated biblical description of the penultimate wisdom, right? And I'll, I'll talk about it in just a minute. Who hath established all the ends of the earth? Now, back in these days, they didn't even know there was a North and South America. They didn't, the people that read, wrote the Bible, but God did. The ends of the earth. And God always had a vision for the ends of the earth. And everything was going to be revealed in its time. And when it was time, and when Europe got really crowded and everything, and he sent out, uh, the Bible says in uh, Genesis, Japheth shall expand. He sent these Europeans out to the ends of the earth to discover new lands, to make more room to set up countries and everything like that. God has had it all in control. Who has established the ends of the earth? Who's the one with the plan? Who's the one that knows how to put it together? Now look, I love God, and this gives me a lot of joy. Because half the time, i got to confess, I don't even know what's going on. Okay, seriously. And besides that, I'm tired, like Jacob. I'm tired. I mean, it's like, oh, come on, man, really? But I know the one who can take the wind in his fists. 
I know the one who goes up and down and up and down and who, now listen, who can connect to unconnectable places. There is no place in the universe as sinful as this earth. And there's no place in existence as holy as heaven. How did he bring us together? How did he make us fit to go there? Have you ever thought about the wisdom of the plan of salvation? You would never come up with it, and neither would I, not in a million years. But he made a way. He made a righteous way. This is the beauty of the book of Romans. Uh oh, I'm starting to wander. Uh, the, God had to find a righteous way to save us. He can't just by decree and fiat. He's a holy God. He brought heaven and earth together. He made a way for us to go to heaven. And he is, Jesus said, I am the ladder between heaven and earth. That's what Jesus is saying in John 1. I am Jacob's stairway. Through me, the commerce occurs. Angels can come down to this sinful world and bring blessings from God to people because of me. And angels are going to get sent right back up there to report for duty again. And they're going to come down again and they bring answers to prayer. And God runs his universe and there'd be no connection whatsoever if it wasn't for Jesus and his salvation, right? And so he says, uh, what's his name? And the name is, uh, the funny part about this, I mean, the, the Hebrews have a different sense of humor, okay? It is that the name is in JACA. JACA is an acronym. The, the, uh, JACA means the Lord, blessed is he. It's an acronym, okay? So that's the answer to the riddle. What's his name? But then there's an answer that they couldn't come up with, not for centuries. What's his son's name? What's his son's name? This is one of those parts of the Old Testament where he says, there is a Godhead, not just a soul, monotheistic, solitary God. There's a Godhead. What's his name and what's his son's name, if you can tell? Now, we are on the other side of it, aren't we? So we can tell. His son's name is Jesus. Now, this man who says he's so stupid, though, he does have one thing going for him. And this is part of this sermon. Let's move on to the next part. And that is that he knows he's stupid, but he has an absolute unwavering trust in the word of God. Every word of God is pure. That means it has been tested by fire. Every single word of God is pure, and he is a shield to them that put their trust in him. So he knows he doesn't know anything. He said he's stupid. He's one of the few people in the Bible who call himself stupid. But he swings right into where his real confidence is. Not in self, but in him. And in fact, so much not in self, especially not in his own words. He says, do not add to his words. By the way, didn't I tell you that uh, Revelation and Proverbs have a very strong connection? One of the last warnings in the Bible, do not add anything to the word of God. He says, don't add to his words. Lest he reprove you. And you're going to be found a liar. Now, let's move on to his prayer life. Because this is a teaching about true humility. Or it, he gets into arrogance too. And what a contrast. Boy, do we live in an arrogant day. What's Paul warn us about? In the last days, perilous times will come. And what does Paul think is perilous? Well, men will be lovers of themselves. And part of that is that they think that everything that they think is right, and they're not teachable, they can't be approached, can't be corrected, certainly not. And they will be lovers of themselves more than lovers of God. He says, two things have I required of you. This is his prayer. Deny, deny me them not before I die. Now, I always, I always labored over this. I couldn't quite understand, okay? Remove far from me vanity and lies. Well, that's one thing. Okay, now I do get that. Please deliver me from vain philosophies, from the imaginations of men, from what the Bible actually calls the vain imagination, which the world is just collapsing before right now. The, the, the people are in the grip of a vain imagination. The kings of the earth have promoted this, okay? Uh, he says, please deliver me from these. 
Now, why is he praying to be delivered from them? Because he's got the, the humility to know that he could be taken in also. See, I remember I went up to, with my dear wife, we were writing a book about something called the Toronto Blessing, where Pentecostals had just gone crazy and were having fits in, in, in a church in Toronto. People were going there in the thousands to go participate in this. And the whole thing was they're getting people drunk in the spirit. It's another subject for another time, but I mean, it was seriously a loony bin, okay? And uh, we went up there to do research for a book because I knew that people would tell me this fallacy, which I wanted to anticipate, that how could you say anything about it if you hadn't gone up there? So I know that's a fallacy, but I, I thought I'd concede. So I went up there. And people were hitting their heads on the ground, and people were falling out, and people were dr getting drunk. And when the preacher would go to preach the word, uh, people would laugh at it, especially at serious things like hell. And the preacher would laugh. And they were just, just going crazy. And I talked to people afterwards, and uh, th there was a couple of thousand people there, and it was December, and they were standing out in line for four hours to get into this lunatic asylum. And I said, don't you fear, do you, you know enough about the Bible to know there's going to be a tremendous deception come in the last days, and God will send strong delusion. They all said, yes, yes, we do. But then they kind of laughed and said, but that's not us. See, because we are... You know, they've been listening to these prophets. You are the last generation, the cutting edge, the great end times revival. I mean, all this crazy stuff. And it seduced them. They actually believed it. And they weren't, you know, they were already deluded. Okay. And a lot of, a lot of the preachers I talked to said, man, I quit preaching the Bible a long time ago. It doesn't do any good. The spirit is what we need. Now, look, this guy doesn't have that attitude. Look at his attitude. I pray to you, God, that you deliver me from vanity and lies, from vain imaginations, from philosophies of men, from heresy and false doctrine. That's the right attitude. And then he prays about something else, too. And this has really always touched me. Do not give me poverty or riches. Don't. It goes to two extremes. Please don't make me too poor and please don't let me get too rich. And he gives the reason why. He says, feed me with the food convenient for me. Give me just what I need. And then he said, lest I be full and deny thee. And say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal. And take the name of my God in vain. I mean, if I get poor enough, I'm liable to steal. And that would be a denial of God's name. Now, I wrestled over this for years, and then one day it just dawned on me. It hit me. What is he saying? He said, God, I don't trust myself. I'm afraid of myself. So please keep me from my own excesses. Okay. Now, let's go on. Accuse not a servant to his master, lest he curse thee. And thou be found guilty. Okay, well, uh, I'm not going to go in too deep into this part, but basically what he's saying is part of my humility, part of the wisdom I walk in, don't get involved in other people's business. And secondly, don't accuse or tell lies about people that are poor and defenseless compared to you and your position. You see what I'm saying? That's wisdom too, just leave it be. Leave it be, stay out of it. What, what pride makes people into in some cases is busybodies and nanny states. I mean, look, look, at, look how many people are turning each other in for masks or you, uh, calling people out in the grocery store. <laughs> what in the world? Are we coming to? Well, the conditioning of our leaders is actually separating us that way, but that's another story. But let me go on. Okay. There is a generation that curses their father and does not bless their mother. There's a generation that are pure in their own eyes, yet they're not washed from their filthiness. And there is a generation, how lofty are their eyes, and their eyelids are lifted up. 
There is a generation whose teeth are like swords, their jaw teeth as knives, to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. Now, first thing I want to say about this is this man is a prophet. This is, I think it's Jacob. And this is a prophecy, and this is also a progression. When he says there is a generation, that's just an ancient way of saying, look, there, you're going to find people like this. When you see them, know what you're seeing. This is the description of the progression of arrogance. Now, where does it start? Well, they cursed their father and mother. Now, I want to say something about that, too. They won't bless their mother and they will curse their father. Okay, the curse there doesn't mean like a witch putting a spell on someone. It's a word that just means degrade and belittle and put them down. Now, how many believe that that's a serious thing? It's a serious place to be in. One of the Ten Commandments, honor thy father and mother. And one of the commandments of God says that it may be well with you, that you may live long on the earth. I mean, generally speaking, I mean, if you dishonor your parents, it can't go well with you. That, this is why I have always looked at the discipline of children as a very, very serious thing. I mean, not, not a strict thing, not a cruel thing, not a heavy-handed thing, but you must insist on honor. You don't want, we don't want kids like this. And by the way, this, I've lived from 1959 to today. This is the whole progression of American society. Everything was the kids, all the kids, the baby boom. So we had all these kids, built all these schools and everything for these kids. And the kids could do no wrong, and the kids became... Uh, <laughs> they got pocket money, so all music revolved around the kids. Everything was the kids. And then the kids thought they knew better than anything else. Like the expressions like generation gap are fairly recent. Okay. And they've been, you know, even adolescence is a new word. Did you know that? Adolescence is about 100 years old. There no, were no adolescents 150 years ago. What basically young, young people wanted to learn a trade and get started in life and become adult and all that stuff. Only now. Okay. And what we have is uh, a generation that belittles their father and mother, won't bless them. That's a sin. That's a serious sin. But then it doesn't stay there. There's a generation that are pure in their own eyes. Now, this is a very powerful thing. Now, look at all. We have new words in our vocabulary, like virtue signaling. Everyone uh, wants to show how pure they are. Now, I want to say something about this generation, okay? That, look, when... Let me just talk about Americans. Americans are haunted by Christianity. Did you know that? That if, even if we're not practicing Christianity, we have a Christian background, a Christian conscious. Now, the devil is trying to stamp that out, so it won't be, gone, won't, won't be around for long. So basically, uh, even if you don't go to church, and even if you sleep with your girlfriend, and even if you're an abortion proponent, or even if you're a homosexual, is you got to have some kind of virtue. Like lately the mask is the virtue, and the, for a while it was anti-smoking is the virtue. And the people that would not be preached to and would not obey rules, I've never seen such scrupulous nanny state people in all my life as this generation for to showing how good they are and how woke they are and how virtuous they are. And this is what he's warning about back here in the book of Proverbs. There's a generation that are so pure, but notice what he says, in their own eyes. Half the problem is we've uh, redefined purity. Did you know that like political correctness is actually a religious expression? All, it's all religious. People got to be pure, right? But the, if you redefine purity, like we used to believe that purity means that you feared God and your sins were forgiven and you eschewed the things that God eschewed and you loved the things that God loved. Now that would be a pure person. In fact, there's a great book with a great title, The Pure of Heart Only Want One Thing, not two, one. 
in the deepest part of their being, they want God, right? That's what purity is, okay? But this generation does, is godless, but they still want to have a virtue. And they still have uh, virtue signaling. And what do you call it when people go out in the street? It's actually religious, too. Black Lives Matter. You bow down and that's worship. <laughs> They're worshiping an ideology. Our modern gods are, are not necessarily wood, hay, uh, gold, silver. Our modern gods are isms. There is a generation that's pure in their eyes. Now, I don't want to be crude, but I'm going to tell you what the rest of this verse actually says, literally, in the Hebrew. They think that they're pure, but they haven't even properly washed themselves after going to the bathroom. They don't know how bad they stink, morally, spiritually. That's what this literally says. They're not washed from their filthiness. But then it goes further. There's a generation. How lofty are their eyes? Now, let me say something about the book of Proverbs and eyes. And a lot of the Bible and eyes. The eyes are the organ of judgment. You make judgments. You look at something. God looked at everything and said it's good. So with his eyes, he just decreed that all was good. Or that we don't want to be standing before the eyes of God in our sin. We don't want to die in our sin, right? Because those eyes... Okay, these people, is what he's saying, are so lofty in their eyes. Everyone else is bad. All of the past is bad. Now, now look, you can see this as a religious movement too, even with every single honorable person in American history has now been judged, condemned, and executed. Okay, they even tear down the statue of Washington and threw him in a pond somewhere out there in Boston. I mean, are you kidding me? These people couldn't hold a candle to Washington. These people couldn't hold a candle to Robert E. Lee. <laughs> I know, a lot of, I'm gonna get a lot of hate for that, but it's true. They have no idea what they're talking about. They don't know what they're talking about. They've been indoctrinated. But look, he says, look, they look at everything and I mean, I've been told this too. I, mean, I told a young girl that it was not right to be a lesbian. You cannot be a Christian and a lesbian. Oh, you would not believe that. the lecture I got from her and her friends. I mean, it was unbelievable, okay? How lofty are their eyelids? You know, you don't have to listen to a 60-year-old man as a preacher. If you're 18, 16, 15, you know everything, right? You know it all. Don't, if you can do anything about it, don't let your kids think that, that that's all right. Fight it. Because it doesn't stop there. There's a generation, how lofty are their eyes? Their eyelids are lifted up. There's scriptures in the Bible about judgment where it says God's eyelids. You know, he opens his eyes and you go, oh God, no. These kids are like that now. <laughs> they, they think they... It's frightening, isn't it? This is, but it's also... See, because remember what the sermon's about. Pride and arrogance. It's the height of arrogance. It's so powerful. It's what Paul warned about in the last days. Lovers of self. It doesn't stop with judgment. It doesn't stop with virtue signaling. It doesn't stop with belittling your own parents. You know, in the law of God, if, if the child belittled their parents, there was a law that said, if you can't work it out, take it to the elders. And if, if there's no resolve, then stone them. Now, I, I don't advocate that, of course, obviously. But that does tell you, the law teaches us the severity of some sins. I mean, rebellion is really, really bad. And you know, you think about how innocent it was. I'd be like, if we were flashed back to the early 1960s or something, we'd be shocked. We'd think we're on a new planet. And you got movies like Rebel Without a Cause, and man, the people just loved it. It was just awesome, right? Because what was it, an angry, unsatisfied, bitter, youth living in the most prosperous nation on the face of the earth. If you think about it, it's insane, isn't it? But it didn't stop there. There is a generation whose teeth are as swords. Their jaw teeth are like knives. I mean, they're like animals. And what they do with their mouths is powerful. 
to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among the men. Well, I thought they all liked the poor and the, and the homeless. Well, God, God gave me an example of this when I was going through this passage. Think of all these people in cities who these buffoons have successfully defunded police departments. How would you like that? Most of these people aren't even in the city, from that city. <laughs> They're dismantling police departments and murder rates are soaring. And who's the ones the most directly affected? The blessed poor and the blessed homeless that they all claim and virtue signal that they love. Who is most likely to be aborted in this country? The babies of the poor. Their teeth are like knives. They're like swords. These do-gooders are evil. And they are warned about right here. And they have another problem too. Now, <laughs> this is a, a great sermon, but it's very uncomfortable in places, okay? He goes on to talk, it's not a new subject, the horse leech. The horse leech has two daughters, and both of them have the same name. Because it doesn't say cry in the text. It just says, here's daughter one. What's her name? Give me. Here's daughter two. What's her name? Give me. <laughs> and there'll never be enough. I mean, you think about leftism in this country. Like Biden is per it's currently on a $1.6 trillion spending spree. What? <laughs> What's that money going to go for? Buying new friends, new votes, entrenching people in power, picking winners and losers, destroying businesses. <laughs> How'd this happen? So what he says, there are three things that are never satisfied. See, what is a horse leech? There are human horse leeches, human, human vampires, human parasites. Now look, the, one thing I like about the Bible, it's brutal. Sometimes I find it describing myself, and so you gotta take the medicine and let it change you. There are human horse leeches, okay? They all, they're never, ever, ever satisfied. Four things, now this is a Hebrewism where you say three things and then he says four. In other words, okay, I'm gonna give you three examples. Oh no, four, that's a Hebrewism to really make this emphasis. Four things that never say it's enough. And this is what dissatisfaction is like because dissatisfaction too is a form of pride. Now why would dissatisfaction be a form of pride? Remember the whole meaning of the sermon is pride and humility, okay? Dissatisfaction is a form of pride because of the 10th commandment. The 10th commandment, thou shalt not covet. But every single of God's commandments can also be better understood by the inversion of them. Thou shalt not covet is negative. You should not crave what has not been given to you by God. You just simply shouldn't do it. It's gonna just destroy your life if you do anyway. But what is the inversion of it? Thou shalt be content with what God gave you. Now look, this description of these arrogant and, and these, especially the, the generation that thinks they know everything, okay? How, how did so many get to that point? Now we're in the fourth stage now, violence in the streets. How may, how'd they get there? The cultivation of dissatisfaction. I mean, what, isn't that what the serpent did to the first couple? You think they lacked anything? Adam and Eve had everything. And you think they had a bad, dim prospect for the future? The future was theirs. They had it by the tail. Go and take this garden, develop it. You got meaningful work and you'll be blessed. Eat all the trees of the garden, have kids, go on. Where do we find him in Genesis three? Just at that one place. God said, don't go there. See, the serpent, now they call it uh, revolutionary consciousness. See, because most of what's going on in this country, the architect is, uh, is Marxism. And Marxism's first stage is to inculcate a revolutionary consciousness. You take people perfectly content and you force feed them 
Every fault, every flaw, every so-called lack, every injustice, or every interpretation of history, that le and you just cram it into their skulls until they're no longer the happy little people. Like, I can't tell you how many times I heard about young women going to college and university, and the feminists got a hold of them. And the, their parents can't, can't even recognize the daughter because she's angry at all men. And she believes that all are going to be oppressors and all. And by the way, the university is a place of much sexism and much abuse of people. But they pretend to be the solution. They're the problem. See, revolutionary consciousness. Now, look, even with the, uh, black America, of course there's a history. Everybody has a history. But if that's what you're force fed and also an interpretation, and then you, and then you get the, and it's diabolical, white, uh, white privilege, because that automatically involves everybody, no matter what their history is, okay? No matter what their parents did, no matter which side of the Civil War they were on, no matter whether they had slaves or not. I mean, everyone is guilty of a certain group. Now, this is how Satan works. And look what he says, that they'll never be satisfied. They'll never be satisfied. Four things will never say it's enough. And you know what it's like? He's going to give you four examples of what it's like. Now, I, this is part of why I believe this is uh, Jacob. Number one, it's like the grave. You know, someone dies, you think, oh, what a shame. How am I going to get over that? And then someone else dies. <laughs> oh, my gosh. No. Hey, man, everybody. Now, back then, it wasn't it, the grave. It was, it was not heaven or hell. It was Sheol. It was some got to go to be with Abraham to wait, and then others had to go to the place waiting for punishment. And when Jesus died, he went down and released the captives in Abraham's bosom. But the point is, hell is never, ever, ever satisfied until God sh shuts the final door. It's, the grave is always going to be demanding more. And another thing is the barren womb. Now, Jacob knew about this because he had two wives and two concubines. And by the way, the Bible never presents such an arrangement positively. It's never. I mean, God used it, but it's not positive. Jacob had Leah, his first wife, which he was deceived into marrying, and he had Rachel, his favorite wife. And the problem is Leah was very verdant, but Rachel could not have a child. And she got to the point where she's saying to him, she's making his life miserable, give me a child or I'm going to die. When are you going to give me a child? I want a child. I want a child. And I mean, you know, no one could get to a husband like a wife, you know. Especially if it's your favorite wife, all right? Um, anyway, uh, he knows. Barren womb. Enough to drive a man. You know what he said to her? Am I God? Am I God? But, by the way, I want to tell you a side thing. Okay. I read this story that for years. I'm like, why did you do it that way, Lord? Why? He loved Rachel. Why did he get Leah? And of course, there's a human element, right? But the truth is, God chose Leah to be the mother in the line of Jesus Christ. And not even him or his machinations could change that. Because Leah had Judah. And Judah, as you know, our Lord sprang out of Judah. Now, eventually, Rachel had a child. Now, it goes on. The earth that is not filled with water. Well, you read, I won't have you turn there, but you read Ecclesiastes. I mean, waters flow out of streams, right, into rivers, out of the ocean, and then the sun evaporates them right back in the clouds, and they ran on the ground. So the earth is never, ever going to stop receiving water. And fire. A fire never says it's enough. As long as there's fuel, a fire will burn. By the way, usually in Proverbs, when fire is spoken about, He's talking about the tongue and strife. Cast out the scorner and the strife shall cease as a coal removed from the fire. So the scorner, take, get him out and the fire will go out. All right, look, these are, these are leeches. This is, this is the human leech that sucks the life out of everybody. Look, 
there is serious talk in Washington about reparations. There was, okay, 1965, Lyndon Johnson said, we're gonna, we're gonna take care of this injustice and we're gonna have a war on poverty. And he spent uh, $22 billion in transfer payments. And you know, in 2000, was it 15? Yeah, 2015, the 50th anniversary of that. And they were writing a thing on it in Time Magazine of all places, a liberal place. And they said, you know, 50 years ago, we spent $22 trillion to get rid of poverty. At the time we did it, the poverty rate was 14%. And they said, guess where the poverty rate is 50 years later? 14%. <laughs> what? Leeches. Never enough. And dissatisfaction, you know, Satan has a minstrel named Mick Jagger, and he wrote a song, and even a broken clock could be right twice a day. And he, he wrote this for the devil, but it's, I can't get no satisfaction. Dissatisfaction is a spiritual problem, and it's a pride problem, because people just can't content themselves unless they're with God. They can't say, God, I don't want anything that I can't say you're giving me. Now let me move on, okay. He says, the eye that mocks at his father and despises to obey his mother, the ravens of the valley shall pick it out and the young e eagles shall eat it. Well, that's gruesome, isn't it? The eye that mocks his, at his father or belittles his father, same word, belittles his father, refuses to obey his mother. What's gonna happen? The ravens of the valley shall pick it out. The young eagles shall eat it. Well, first of all, he's actually uh, quoting the Deuteronomic co Covenant, which in, in Deuteronomy, uh, well, let's see, I know I got it here somewhere. He says that one of the consequences of faithlessness to God is that your bodies will lay out in the field and ravens will come and eat them. What's gonna happen at the last day, in the last days? What's the end of all this people lovers of themselves, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy? What's gonna happen? Read the end of Revelation, that's right. There's the ravens are gonna come and, the, and they're gonna have a great feast of the Lord. But even on a spiritual, more spiritual level too. Look, you get a kid and they're happy and they love you and everything like that. And they think their parents are right and they're awesome. And you have got their heart. But if that ever changes, okay, you get that cold, glassy, dead eye. And what did Jesus say in the parable of the sower? We'll come and steal the word. The birds. The birds. The devil could see that rebellion and say, get him. Take them out. Now, unfortunately, our, our society is, our culture is so toxic that it's almost like considered normal. And I get that and I don't, you know, we can't condemn anyone. We just got to fight for them. We got to fight for them. Because this is a serious thing. Now, there are three things which are too wonderful for me. Yea, four which I don't know. See, remember, he's, he's a humble guy. I'm stupid, I don't get it, but I have the word, right? But he does make an observation about life. Three things and then four. So you think this is fantastic, right? And so what are they? The way of an eagle in the air, the way of a serpent on a rock, and the way of the ship in the sea, and the way of a man with a maid. Now, isn't that romantic? I've actually seen that on a Hallmark card. The way of a man with a maid. And a fun young love, just beautiful. Okay, but I'm going to give you the cynical interpretation, all right? And I'll tell you why I will. It's not my cynicism. I think it's right in the text. Okay, now what is the way of an eagle in the air? Well, an eagle will come right out of the sky and just snatch something and fly away. And can you track it? Does it leave a trail? Not in the air. Pirates. They just descend on a ship and rob everybody and then they take off. A man with a maid, the boy says, you know, I love you. But if he took a truth serum, he might be saying, I love me, but I sure want you. Now, is that not realistic? I'm not saying it's gonna happen in every case, but you know, 
The book of Proverbs is a book of realism. And someone says, Pastor Bill, why are you so, so cynical? Oh, because we haven't got to the fourth one. <laughs> Such is the way of an adulterous woman. She eats, daintily wipes her mouth, and says, I didn't do anything wrong. This is our evil generation. Nothing wrong with fornication. Nothing wrong with homosexuality. Nothing wrong with anything. What? What did I do? He put it with them. I didn't. <laughs> I wouldn't get a Hallmark card that said that. You think you're going to see a Hallmark card with that verse? I doubt it. Someone says, move on. I got that sinking feeling. For three things, the earth is disquieted. For four, it just can't take. It just can't take it. For a servant when he rules, and a fool when he's filled with meat. For an odious woman when she's married. Now, I don't, I'm not even going to try that one, all right? I don't know. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> and a handmaid that is heir to her mistress. Okay, now, but I will try generally. What is so troubling about this? Well, number one, it's servant when he reigns, okay? Now, look, here's the thing. The Bible does, is not like modern days, okay? Egalitarianism. Everyone's the same. A servant is a servant. And a ruler is a ruler. Now, I'm not saying that a person can't be whatever God wants them to be. But generally speaking, there are people, they're, they're supposed to be responsible, they're supposed to care about people, and they're supposed to take care of things. But what happened 110 years ago in the Bolshevik Re Revolution? Some of the worst, most worthless, disgruntled, hate-filled people, like Joseph Stalin, actually got the reins of power. And you know what? As much as people hate Hitler, and I, I hate him too, but he made Hitler look like a piker, like a little Sunday school teacher. Mao never brushed his teeth. His teeth were green. He was a peasant and an idiot and a moron, but he got the reins of power and killed 20 million of his own people. Stalin engineered deliberate famines of farmers in the Ukraine. Killed four million people. They starved to death. Can you imagine starving to death when you have wheat? <laughs> this is what he's warning about here. When slaves and servants and ignorant people, when they seize the power, they certainly weren't elevated to that by God. That is not like King David's ascension. Nothing like it at all. They did not elevate themselves in God. They did it with their own rebellion. A fool when he's filled with meat. Well, uh, Biden's working on a living wage so people don't even have to work anymore to eat. You know what? The earth can't take that. Something really bad is coming because when the natural order is you must work and then you can earn your meal. And there's even a moral dimension to this. If you get to live without work, what? I, I told you I'm going to pass the odious woman, all right? Maybe, well, maybe we'll do a whole time on that next time, all right? And, uh, and the handmaiden that's heir to her mistress. What? Then they left the, everything to the handmaiden? Now, let me just go a few more because these are really good. And they all go with the same thing, pride and humility. So what happens when little people that are not qualified get elevated? Some bad, ugly things happen, all right? But there are four things which are little on the earth, but they're exceedingly wise. Ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. Conies are but a feeble folk, but they make their homes in the rocks. The locusts don't have a king, but they go forth all of them by bands. The spider takes hold with her hands and friends ends up in the king's palaces. Now, I'm, I'm fixing the clothes, okay? But this is the wisdom of Edgar, and it's all one sermon, so I gotta do it justice, okay? Look. These are, this is the opposite. He's contrasting. The earlier one was arrogance. When arrogant, uh, ignorant, evil people somehow get themselves in positions of power, bad things happen. 
Like Biden and Kamala, they're really, really bad people, all right? Now, but the, the other thing is the contrast. What happens with humble people when they use wisdom? Well, we could be like the ants. The ants all work together, plan ahead. They don't make a lot of noise, do they? You're not gonna see a big ant demonstration out in the street. They're not gonna burn down Target, all right? The ants just, go, just keep on going, just keep on plugging away, and they get their meat ready in the summer. Conies are something like a rabbit. Now here's the thing, the wisdom of a rabbit is this. He knows he's not tough. Rabbits are not tough, all right? You'll never see a rabbit, you know, really show toughness. That's why you rarely ever see a sports team, the Los Angeles Bunnies or something like that. It's just never gonna happen, okay? And they know it. Remember, this is about humility. They know it. So what do they do? They make sure they make their homes in rocks. Really can't be gotten at. See, God wants us to have wisdom. How about uh, locusts? They don't need to be told what to do. They don't have a king. They just go out in bands. Now their real king is invisible, it's God. God is the king of the locusts. I'll tell you a weird story about Muhammad. Muhammad had a dream that all of a sudden he's sitting there and these locusts just pour out of heaven and just pour over him. And he heard a voice that he thought was God, but I think it was the devil. He said, you are the king of the locusts. So the Muslims love locusts. But when, if the Bible says anything about locusts having a king, it's Apollyon, Satan. Muhammad's king of the locusts, all right. Now, as, as, as disgusting and odious as spiders are, Jonathan Edwards was a great American preacher. He preached a sermon called Sinners in the Hands of a, an Angry God. A great sermon. I actually heard it on CD and it scared me. I'm saved, I'm going to heaven. That sermon scared me, it disturbed me. He said, you know how you pick up a spider web, you see a spider on the end, you just hate it, you can't wait to step on it. He said, well, you unrepentant sinners, you have no idea how close you are to judgment and how close you are to God just stepping on you. And it just really bothered me, but it was powerful. And it provoked a revival. Many people get, got saved. Now, as odious as a spider is, how do they end up in king's palaces? Now, this could go either way. Humble people with wisdom can go to high places even if they have a lot of ugliness about them. Or it can go the other way. You look at someone like, remember Dick Morris and people like that, how'd they end up near power? How do these Cretans get up there? Well, there are three things which go well. Four, they're comely and they're going. A lion, which is the strongest among beasts, and will not turn away from any. And you know what he's saying there? And that's right. That's so right. You know why it's right? Because God made the lion to be like that. Fierce, powerful. I mean, they do look majestic, you've got to admit. How majestic. So majestic that the Son of God took the title, the Lion of the Tribe of Judah. In other words, there are some situations that are so right, they're so in the will of God, that there's not a thing wrong with them. Now, if you get a jackass that gets up there and tries to act like a lion, you go, something's wrong, it's not right. But a lion, a greyhound, a he-goat also, and a king against whom there's no rising up. See, the, the, the kings are right. I mean, they should serve, they should do better than they do, but that's something God appointed. Uh, a greyhound, I mean, they're just beautiful, sleek. I even look at our mastiff, I mean, he's just majestic beast, beautiful animal. And uh, a he-goat, you know, the, the goat's gonna have a leader. That's gonna be the he-goat, right? And I think of our roosters out in the, out in the yard. We got one named Jeffrey, and man, does he ever think he's a lion that he struts like that? But I can't help but think, you know, this is right. This is so right. This is the way God made him. You go back to the slaves and the arrogant and the thieves and the, and the usurpers, that's not right. But this is right, okay? So there have been so many, many great kings in history, like Alfred the Great and even Cyrus the Great. He said, now look. This is the close of the sermon, so everyone's going to go, yeah, whew, finally. If you've done foolishly, 
in lifting up yourself. See, there are some things that are right because God made them happen, right? So a lion doesn't need ambition to be majestic. He just is. But you know how foolish vainglory and ambition is? I mean, there is a good ambition. I want to be useful. And I want to be put where God wants me to be. I don't care where it is. I don't care what the situation. I want to be where God wants me to be. But nothing is going to churn you inside out like ambition, which is just a counterfeit for it, vainglory. He says, if you've done foolishly in lifting up yourself or if you've thought evil, lay your hand on your mouth. Give it up. Turn it over. Surely the churning of milk brings forth butter. So there are some good things you can churn. If you're in the will of God, butter's good. But what if you churn your nose? What is it going to bring forth? In other words, what if ambition takes a hold of you? Now this is the man. I believe it's Jacob. He stood there. He says, man, I don't know that much. I'm stupid. I don't think he was stupid by my standards, but he was sincere. I, he's not trying to be humble. <laughs> I'm stupid because I know, I get it. The more you know. How close did he get to God? He wrestled him. You ever wrestled God? Not the way he did. I mean, I believe my whole life's been up wrestling with God, and so is yours. But, you know, he wrestled him. He said, no, I'm stupid. I don't know a thing. He's walking around with a limp. He goes to Pharaoh and says, man, my whole life's been short and evil. I haven't attained to what my fathers did. And he's saying, look, give up, give up worldly ambition. Give up vainglory. Just tell God you want to be what you want him to be. If you're supposed to churn anything, churn up butter. Don't churn blood. Don't churn strife. Because people will oppose you. They'll drive you crazy when they contradict you and you'll fight back. And nothing good ever comes of it. Put yourself in the hands of God. People are going to say things about people. People are going to lie. People do what people do. No use losing any sleep over it. Give it to God. We go back to like who really, who really ascends and descends? Who really can grab the winds in their hands? We know who that is. It's not us. We don't have the wisdom to establish the ends of the earth. But he does. Father, in the name of Jesus, if there's anything in this sermon that can help anyone, breathe your breath of life on it. For your word is alive, pure, tested, and true. And we really can build our life on it, and we really can set it up as a shield. In Jesus' name, amen.